Greetings everyone, and welcome back to another episode of Fanfic Read Through. I am Tsubaki94, and I'm still reading to you my Danny fan of fanfic. What else is there to say? Get yourself comfortable, get your perfect brew of tea or coffee or chocolate or, you know, just snuggle up with a cat or dog. I like both. And let's begin. Life's Trial, Chapter 29 to 30. Enjoy. <laughs> A family of four was parked in a driveway to Mrs. Oswald's house when Danny returned. He stopped beside it for a moment before peeking in through the kitchen window. He saw Mrs. Oswald sitting across the table from a less than formally dressed Mrs. Stewart. There were things placed on the table between them that Danny couldn't see without being seen himself. Turning away from the window, he walked into the house. As soon as the door clicked shut, Mrs. Oswald spoke. Daniel, can you come in here? She called from the kitchen. Kicking off his wet shoes and leaving them in the hall, then he walked over to the kitchen door. Mrs. Oswald, her arms crossed over her chest, and Mrs. Stewart, with her legs crossed and a notebook in her hands, were both facing him. On the table between them were Danny's first aid kit, the medicine box from Lad, and his broken phone. Hello, Mrs. Stewart, said Danny in a dull tone, water dripping down his face. Hi, hey, Daniel. Would you take a seat? She answered, pointing for Danny to sit down on the chair between them. Walking into the kitchen, Danny removed his jacket and hung it on the back of the chair before sitting down. I had a very disturbing phone call from Mrs. Oswald two hours ago. Can you imagine what it was about? Mrs. Stewart began. Pushing his wet hair out of his face, Danny looked at Mrs. Stewart. Do you want me to answer that, or do you want to continue your story? He said, well aware of what Mrs. Oswald might have told her. An indifference to the consequences. Seeing as he was already in a bad situation, it couldn't get much worse. Sighing, Miss Stewart looked down on her notebook. She said that she found you in your room, cutting yourself, and when she confronted you, you ran away. It was clear a summary of what Mrs. Oswald had told the social worker, but it wasn't untrue. Nodding, Danny glanced at Mrs. Oswald. Nodding, Danny glanced at Mrs. Oswald. The woman was dressed like she had been earlier that day. Jeans and a sweater. Her curves fell down her back, freed from the confines at the back of her head. When I saw you earlier today, you didn't seem like you wanted to hurt yourself. What happened? After I left my parents' house? Nothing, said Danny, fingers tugging at the hem of his sleeves. I didn't cut myself so you know, but you wouldn't believe me if I told you what really happened, so why should I bother? Mrs. Oswald opened her mouth to speak, but closed it again after a look from Mrs. Stewart. Tell us what happened. We are listening, she said, keeping a calm and methodical tone of voice. Scratching at the back of his head, then sighed. He had thought of how he was going to explain the cuts on his arms, and he had decided on the half-truth. A tiger ghost decided to sharpen its claws on my arms yesterday night, he said, omitting the part about him fighting the ghost, or being a ghost himself. After all, those were unimportant details. The social worker looked down at her nose before she looked over at Mrs. Oswald. You said he told you he'd been scratched by a cat, right? Yes, and he tried to blame his lateness yesterday on a ghost, said Mrs. Oswald in a tired voice. Turning back to Danny, Mrs. Stewart placed her notebook on the table. Show me your arms, Danny, she said, holding out her hands. Pulling up the sleeves of his shirt, the two women were surprised to see the white bandages covering his forearms. He held them out for the two women to see. Is that enough? He asked, too tired to play games. Let me see, Miss Stewart said, taking Dan's left arm in her hands. She found the tied off ends of the bandages, and with ease of practice, removed the fabric to reveal seven stitched up cuts. Inspecting the stitches, she turned Dan's arms left and right before asking to see the other one. The stitches on that arm weren't as nice as the one on his left arm, but they did the job. Who did this? Who stitched you up? She asked, putting the bandages back on around the wounds. I did, answered Danny. He didn't expect the startled surprise in the two women's face. Mrs. Oswald's jaw dropped, and Mrs. Stewart stopped bonding the bandages. Taking the roll of fabric away from the woman, Danny finished covering the cuts on his arms. Didn't it hurt? Mrs. Oswald asked, 
having finally found her words. As much as getting a scratch his head, then he lied. It hadn't hurt that much. His arms had been too numb for the cold to feel much of anything, but they needed to be sewn up or they'd leave big ugly scars. Who taught you to do this? Miss Stewart asked, her notebook and pen in hand once more. YouTube, said Danny, leaning back to slouch in his chair. Anything else, or can I go? He asked, knowing all too well that they weren't finished with him. No, Mrs. Stewart said, straightening and looking down on her notes. Why would a ghost attack you? And if you got these cuts yesterday, why didn't you say anything? Looking at the woman as if she was stupid, then he rolled his eyes. First off, my parents are ghost hunters. Ghosts sometimes decide to go after me because of this. As for your second question, you know that Mrs. Oswald. I didn't know how you would react. I'm used to taking care of myself, so that's what I did. Looking down on her hands, Mrs. Oswald shook her head. You should have told me right away. You shouldn't have hidden this from me. I'm charged with taking care of you as long as you're under my roof. Lies and secrets will only complicate this job for me. Feeling a headache coming on, Danny pinched the spot between his eyes. Let's not start this again, he sighed and turned to Mrs. Stewart. Any more questions? She tapped her pen to the notebook before pointing at the medicine box. What's in the box? she asked. Vitamins and iron supplements, I was told. He couldn't remember exactly what the lad had told him that they were. There is nothing in your files that says you are taking any kind of medicine. How do you get them? Who gave them to you? Mrs. Stewart asked, her pen still tapping her notebook. I think there's a prescription for painkillers that I haven't taken out yet, as well as something in case I have another allergic reaction. He shrugged. And it was Vlad who told me to take them. Something about restoring my immune system after I was sick. The tapping was starting to get irritating. The two women exchanged looks with each other. Mrs. Stewart's pen kept tapping, and then its headache got worse. Finally, Mrs. Stewart turned to Danny and stopped tapping her pen. I want you to do a drug test, Danny, she said. Blinking at the woman, it took Danny a moment for the words to sink in. Um, why? He asked, lowering his hands from his face. You are showing some of the signs of drug use. Changes in behavior, mood swings, changes in sleep patterns, carelessness about personal grooming, as well as some of the symptoms associated with LSD, she said, making Danny look at her in disbelief. Trying to go up with something to say, he shook his head before raising his arms in surrender. All right, whatever, I'm not doing any drugs, so go ahead. He'd come to regret his decision later, but at the moment, he didn't really care that much. End of chapter 29. Chapter 30. You are lucky they didn't decide to move you to some other foster home after this, Sam stated. After having talked to his social worker and Mrs. Oswald for another hour, He'd gone to his room and changed into Phantom. He duplicated himself, making the copy change back to Fenton and go to sleep while he flew off to patrol Amity Park together with Sam and Tucker. They hadn't faced any ghosts that night and were all just in his parents' lab emptying out the Fenton thermos. Then I spent the whole night telling his friends of the confrontation with Mrs. Oswald and the meeting with Mrs. Stewart. Yeah, well, they set up new rules for me. Then I sighed, pressing the flush button on the console. I have to go straight home after school, I'm not allowed to leave the house without supervision, and I'm not allowed internet access if not for school purposes. It's like I'm some kind of child who can't be trusted. You can't be serious about the internet. How are we supposed to play Doom? Said Tucker, looking at Danny as if he had just described hell. Rolling her eyes, Sam elbowed Tucker. That's not the most important thing right now. She told him and turned to Danny. She had already made him show her the cuts on his arms, just to stop her worrying after that she'd listened to the story. How are you planning on protecting Amity Park from ghosts now that you are being watched like a hawk your every waking hour? Removing the thermos from the socket, Dana looked inside it. Same way as I am now. He glanced over at them. I had to duplicate myself. The cop is back at the house, sleeping, I think. He scratched the back of his neck. I think the best way is to have a duplicate at Mrs. Oswald's, whenever I can't be there. And I talked to Danielle. She said she'd stand in for me if there ever were any strong ghosts in town that required my full attention. Snapping his fingers, Tucker grinned. That's a great idea. I wonder who came up with it. 
Hey, can't you just have a copy stand in for you all the time? So we can hang out. There's going to be this big gamers meetup this weekend. You want to join? Stomping her foot down on Tucker's, the tech geek smiled at Sam. Steel-toed boots? Ow! She'd kick his calves instead. Come on, that hurts! I wouldn't be kicking you if you weren't saying stupid things. Sam huffed, putting her hands on her hips. What's stupid about Danny having a copy at the foster home and one here? It's smart. Tucker growled, crossing his arms. Sam let out an exasperated son before turning to Danny. You haven't told him, have you? Shrugging, Danny attached his thermos to his utility belt. Don't get mad at me. You only know the side effects because you were bothering me all the time. Looking from Sam to Danny, Tucker raised an eyebrow. Did I miss something? He asked. The ever present smartphone in his hand, typing. Crossing his arms over his chest, Danny looked at his best friends. You remember last summer? Yas got us all to go on a second camping trip, and I couldn't leave the town unguarded. Ghosts kept attacking each and every day. I made a duplicate of myself to protect the town when I was gone. Wait, you told me you didn't go on a trip and spent the weekend at my place playing video games and crashing on the couch when you weren't fighting ghosts, Tucker exclaimed. Nodding, Danny's fingers moved through his hair. I did, and at the same time, I was with my family. When we got home, I re-emerged with my double, thinking everything was going to be just fine. He scratched the back of his head again. I had encountered the side effects knocking me to the ground with exhaustion and migraine not of this world. He met Tucker's eyes. I'd rather not go through that again. Just doing it now will leave me with a headache when I get back. Huh, Tucker said and shrugged. Well, there was bound to be side effects of that ability too. Just like duplication spells in Doom draining your stamina when you finish using it. Exactly. We would add a bonus that I remember everything my double did, and we only share half the injuries as well, said Danny, knowing the spell Tuck was speaking of. Nice! That's even better than that spell in the game. You have two characters to control, but only one health bar, said Tucker, continuing with the game reference. I'm surrounded by people who can only communicate for games, said Sam, rolling her eyes. She knew what they were talking about, being a master in the game already. They were about to place their arms around Danny's shoulders so he could fly them out of the basement when he suddenly jerked his head up and stared into the wall in front of him as if he could see right through it. Is it another ghost? asked Sam, putting her hand on her phantom ghost ray, safely tucked away in her belt. No, no, said Danny, sounding a bit distracted, as if he was talking from a distance even though he was standing right beside them. Shaking his head, he turned back to his friends gripped both of their shoulders and carried them up into the kitchen. When his head whipped around again, his eyes staring at something not there. Suddenly, Danny seemed to go translucent, and his hands faced through his friends, dropping them on the black and white tiled floor. Hey, what gives? His Tucker, well aware of the other phantoms in the house. But Danny didn't look as if he heard them, and was suddenly pulled in the direction he was looking at, abandoning his friends in the dark kitchen. I don't know what that was about, but let's get out of here before anyone sees us and let him explain this in school tomorrow. Sam whispered to Tucker, nudging him to walk towards the back door out of the house. Then he knew he had abandoned his friends at his parents' house, but for some reason it didn't feel important. There was something else that literally called for his attention. He didn't feel like he was flying or moving in any form, yet he saw buildings swoop past him as he faced through anything in his way, until he stopped. Recognizing where he was going, a wrinkle appeared between his eyebrows. Seconds later, he found himself standing in his bedroom at Mrs. Oswald's, staring at the two brawling teenagers. Cody, dressed much like the double of Danny, in only boxes and a t-shirt, was trying to get a chokehold around Danny's neck, at the same time as Danny was trying to throw the kid off of him, without making any noise. The moment the frightened Danny saw his half-see-through double, their eyes met, and in a flash of light, the two were one. Danny Fenton put a hand on his knees, breathing heavily and rubbing at his throat. The memories of what had happened were suddenly there, as if Danny had been there all along. He'd been reading a book in the light of his charged ghost ray, waiting for his copy to return, when the door had opened to real Cody. They had said some things in a low, hissing voice, growing angrier by the minute before Cody had tried to hit him, 
Or was it Dan who had tried to hit Cody? It was all a bit confusing, and he had been there. They had ended up fighting as quietly as they could so as not to wake the other inhabitants in the house. Then he had called his double back to get an advantage, thus unintentionally re-emerging with his other half. Cody blinked in confusion from the spot Danny had just been in over to where he was. The fuck did you do? He asked, flinging himself at Danny. Cold annoyance settled over Danny and instead of continuing the brawl, Danny ended it. Weeks of practicing self-defense with his mom and sister had given him technique and reflexes he couldn't have gotten on his own. In a liquid motion, he gripped both of Cody's wrists, turned him around and kicked his feet out from under him, making the younger teenager hit the floor with a soft thump. Struggling, Cody tried to kick Danny, but the older kid avoided, and knelt down over Cody, knees on either side of his chest. Try that again, and out Cody spat in Danny's face. For a moment, Danny saw red and reacted like he often did in a situation similar to that. He headbutted Cody, remembering in only the last second to rein in his power. Letting out a stifled cry, Cody tried to roll up and cover his face, but Danny didn't let him. I warned you, he hissed. You broke my nose again, Cody whined. Rolling his eyes, Danny put a cold hand to Cody's face and the kid yelped as frost bit into his skin. Shut up, or you'll get into trouble, he growled. Stop acting innocent and explain yourself. Tear-filled eyes glared up at Danny. Explain what? You were the one who hurt and insulted my mom. It's freaks like you who use my mom's kindness and drive her to exhaustion. You should just have killed yourself like you planned. Danny blinked a couple of times, taking in what Cody had said. I don't, and I didn't. He said, trying to remember when he'd used Mrs. Oswald and when he had insulted her. I only told her the truth, as I know it, and don't call me a freak, or I'll be breaking nose for real this time. Wriggling underneath Danny, Cody tried to land another kick, but with no strength behind it, it didn't feel much more than a bump. You are all the same. You all use her and think you can get away with anything because she isn't your mom. But you hurt her. All of you hurt her. Tears were rolling down the sides of Cody's face into his hair. Shaking his head, Danny sighed. I can't speak for the others, but I would never hurt your mom. She's a good woman, and she takes care of my cousin. The cold anger inside of him was slowly melting. As long as Danielle is happy, I'll stay out of your mom's hair. But if you make her life any harder, I'll make sure that all the pranks you've played on me seems like a child's play in comparison. Sneering at Danny, Cody lifted his chin. Do that, and I'll tell mom you've been sneaking out every night, then we'll see who's in trouble. Sighing, Danny got up from Cody. Piss off, I don't have the time to deal with you two. He said and watched Cody scramble to his feet and run out of the room, a hand covering his still bleeding nose. Rubbing his aching head, Danny closed the door to his room and searched for his phone. He found it on the floor, crushed. Pressing the startup button, he got no response from the device, and in anger threw it across the room, hitting a wall where the screen shattered into smaller fragments of glass. He didn't care that it made a loud noise. Climbing back into bed, he pulled the covers over his head, hearing the sound of Mrs. Oswald's feet hitting the floor. End of chapter 30